talks with Germany's new chancellor, Angela Merkel. Now, a case dealing with the constitutionality of the partial now, 2003. Three federal courts ruled the ban unconstitutional, and all those decisions have been appealed. This oral argument from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City in the case National Abortion Federation v. Ashcroft. It's a little over one hour. on the calendar, National Abortion Federation against Ashcroft. Um, and so we will hear the appellant. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Elizabeth Wallstein. I'm an assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York on behalf of the government. And I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Congress passed the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act of 2003 after eight years of studying the medical issues surrounding partial birth abortion. The statute does not- Well, it not wasn't quite eight years of study, was it? I mean, there were a series of, of hearing. There was, there, Congress would take it up periodically uh, as part of their just their regular deliberations. It's not as though it was an eight-year study that culminated in the, in the statute. It, it was not eight consecutive years. It was eight years from 1995 until 2003 that they held hearings and took evidence. Yeah. Okay, go, go, go ahead. I mean, uh, w what I understand the facts are to be here is that after the uh, Stenberg case came down, uh, a couple of years later, uh, the House introduced this bill. Uh, and, and with that, before they had any hearings, which contained findings uh, to rebut, if, if you will, what the court held in Stenberg. And those findings were in the bill. And then they held hearings uh, in support of the bill. Um, and, and eventually it was passed. So uh, it's a situation of the bill preceding the hearing, uh, at least the final hearing that uh, reacted to the uh, Stenberg case? Well, actually, Your Honor, they started, they took up the issue in 1995. With but the Stenberg wasn't decided until 2000. That's right, but they took up the issue and they passed several bills yeah. which were either vetoed okay. or failed in conference. Well, be that as it may, go, go ahead. Your I mean, Honor, I think what you're gonna have to do here is tell us why uh, our hands aren't completely tied by Stenberg. Uh, you know, How is this statute differ, if at all, from the Nebraska law? <clears throat> Your Honor, um, I'll address that question first. Um, it differs greatly, and it's drafted much, much more narrowly than the statute at issue in Stenberg. Um, the problem with the statute in Stenberg, the court says, it, was it, too it could, it could reach the D&E procedure. That exactly was one right. problem. But that's, that's right. But leaving that aside, you've got the health exception, which is removed from both. And that's really what this case, what the, what everybody's battling over here, uh, whether whether you need a health exception or not. And there have been a whole series of cases in the, in the circuits that have said you do, including including the Supreme Court in Stenberg. And now now Congress has come along. They've made findings that you don't need one because this procedure is never medically necessary. But the problem I have with that is that uh, essentially the evidence that they were looking at legislative facts that they were reviewing were not materially different from what was before the court in, in Stenberg. Um, that's really not right, Your Honor. Stenberg. Well, how, how do they differ? Well, uh, they differ significantly. The, in Stenberg, the factual record was extremely small. It was a one-day trial consisting of the plaintiff and his two witnesses on one side, and the government, the Nebraska state, had two witnesses but Neither you know, it's not just witnesses. This isn't like uh, proving a, a, a buy and bust uh, situation on, on a street corner in New York. You have all these uh, uh, learned treatises, medical opinions. You've got opinions coming in from, from uh, 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 associations, doctors' associations, and the like. So that it seems to me that what they said in Stenberg was that, look, we don't know what what the health risks are here of this procedure completely. Doctors vary on their view. There haven't been any studies. 
So we just don't have an answer to this. So under those circumstances, the, the opinion by Justice Breyer, as I read it, says the default is we're going to still require a health exception in this case. Um, and uh, because if we're, if, we're, if, we're, if it turns out that there's no problem here, no harm will have been done. But if, it is, if there is a significant health risk, then, then it will be beneficial. It would be, it would be important to have that. It seems to me that that's what the default is uh, that, that uh, they, they arrived at in, in Stenberg. Your Honor, that's not, um, that's not what Stenberg, it's, it's not the best reading of Stenberg because what Stenberg said is we say that our cases require that a statute that creates significant health risks poses an undue burden. So that's the standard, that's the constitutional standard. And we examine Nebraska's statute to see if it create significant health risks for women. And we conclude, based on this evidentiary record, which consisted of district court findings based on right. very few witnesses, and assertions in an amicus brief to the Supreme Court by ACOG, we find that in these, in the presence of these evidentiary circumstances, the law requires a health exception because on this record, Nebraska has not shown that a health exception is never medically necessary. What you have in the congressional record and in the trial record is an enormous amount of evidence, far beyond what was in the Stenberg record. You have, even in the congressional record. Okay, so you've got, you've got a greater quantity. Well, Let's assume you've got a greater quantity. I, I, you know, I'm not going to go back and parse through you know, exactly what was before each court before the court and before Congress. But let's assume you've got the full panoply before Congress of all the medical opinions and evidence that you could possibly get. The, you, you still have a question here of you have, of, 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 of medical, it seems to me, the same thing that they referred to in the earlier case, medical uncertainty. And what the, evi the fuller development of the record on that question is very significant because what it shows through Congress and through the trial is that uncertainty in, this, in, in actuality is the side that carries the risk, not the side that carries the safety. So what the evidence showed, and at trial it was undisputed, is that you have these incredibly safe alternatives, namely induction and d and &E, which are yeah. performed as in, in, in every. Every in single every case? case, every conceivable medical situation, one or the other can be performed, and that was the trial evidence. Are you and saying there's, there was no evidence before the court in the opinion of some doctors that this procedure was sometimes necessary for the mother's health? There was certainly opinion. There was opinion. It was unsupported by medical evidence of the kind that medicine uses. Well, if doctors have that opinion, doesn't that require a health exception? Well, the answer is no, because what Stenberg said. Well, St Stenberg said you got to, if, if, if there's appropriate medical judgment. That's right, appropriate, which suggests a degree of reasonableness and an objective type of well, what, test. And, and if doctors hold that opinion, why isn't that appropriate, assuming they're not charlatans? Well, because the way medicine works, the trial court heard, was not on intuition and not on theories, particularly when you have these two well-studied and incredibly safe in every conceivable circumstance procedures. So they, I agree, they expressed opinions, but that is not to say they were credible medical evidence of the kind that medical science uses. Um, so the fact is, Second part of your question, yes, there were opinions. As far as credible medical evidence, no, there wasn't. And that's what the district court Why is found. an opinion not evidence? Opinions well, are used all the time to decide ex cases by experts. Opinions are evidence in the litigation sense, but the credibility Well, that's the sense we're in. We've got a trial. Well, and, but the ultimate question is whether the opinion is credible as a matter of medicine and science. And that's, and. So, so, so the way you test, but the only question about that, that all that does is say that that admits of a, of a contrary opinion. So you have, you have, a, you have competing views. You have. And, and you're saying that competing views is not enough uh, here, that, that, uh, that Congress can go ahead and make a finding that it's never medically necessary uh, in the face of, com of competing views. 
Well, that's certainly what, what Turner says, but more deeply, the competing well, Turner's not, views Turner's are not. Well, Turner's not in this area, you know. Uh, it, t Turner's, Turner's, I mean, as far as I can tell, Turner and Salerno, uh, standard cases that we look at all the time, uh, don't seem to be uh, relied upon much when you're in this area. Uh, you know, uh, under Salerno, uh, you would, you could, one, one would draw the conclusion that um, that a facial a facial challenge uh, w would not would not succeed a, a, unless it was unconstitutional in every instance. But 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 these abortion cases seem to turn Salerno on its head, and that if any case uh, entails if if there's if there are any situations of risk, then it becomes facially unconstitutional. Uh, and and uh, so so I'm not sure that uh, and and. So, so really what we're looking at is what the standard is in this case. What, what was it, what is it that the government uh, uh, has, to, has to show? The government has to show that without a health exception, the statute creates no significant health <coughs> risks for women. Okay. That was the standard. Now, in that's the finding it made, correct? That's the that finding Congress made. The f Congress found that it was not medically necessary in any circumstances. Okay, now we don't, ac we, we would, ex we, and, there and assuming that after Congress makes such a finding, uh, at some point there's got to be, there's sufficient evidence to support it, but we're not sure, at least I'm not sure, what level of evidence one is looking at here. What, what, is, the, what is the standard that one applies? Well. What Stenberg says is, we look at all the evidence we have before us, and you make a judgment, as in any question of fact, based on the evidence. Um, just getting back to well, the... Well, a, 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 nobody, a, a final fact finder can't just make a final determination uh, without there being a quantum of evidence that is necessary to support that determination. Uh, and my question is, what is the quantum of evidence? What is the standard that we would look at to see whether Congress's finding is supported or not? Well, the legal standard is whether the finding is reasonable and supported by substantial evidence, which is a familiar standard in the, well, Car in the law. Well, Carhart didn't say that, that we kind of count up the weight of the evidence pro and con. They said if there's appropriate medical judgment that there's a health risk, then there's got to be a health exception. They didn't say uh, it's a burden of proof, it's a clear and convincing evidence or any of the traditional trial standards. They just talked about appropriate medical judgment. Uh, I'm not sure that's right, Your Honor. I is, that's not what Breyer said, Justice Breyer? What Stenberg said yes. is you, you do look to the weight. You have to look to the they weight. They didn't and talk about appropriate medical judgment? That phrase that isn't is in the, the legal, opinion? Yes, that was the legal standard. But And does that suggest to you that it's a matter of how many witnesses say there's no health risk versus how many say there's Certainly there? not. It's a not question that. of certainly not, but that is what this If there's any of, appropriate medical judgment, you got to have a health exception. Isn't that what they said? It, no, the standard is if it's necessary in appropriate medical judgment. And the case and the factual analysis was all about determining whether it's appropriate, whether it's necessary in appropriate medical judgment. And so it's, it certainly is about counting up the weight. It's not counting up the number. It is counting up the weight. And what Senberg said is so Nebraska hasn't shown us that it's never so if necessary. So if 10 doctors very persuasively say it's not needed and eight say it is needed, and Congress says we go with the 10, you don't have to have a health exception? Because you have to look at what is behind the opinions. What you have here is conclusory, unsupported opinions that have been, that they have see, been advanced no, over and over. The problem is that there's no definitive study either way. Well, well, Your Honor, the Chasen study contributes, well, it may not be definitive, but it's a peer-reviewed study that certainly contributes to the, quest, the medical question, namely, is it safer? And the answer is no. The outcomes were exactly the same in the short term. And it raised questions about serious long-term complications. So what I started to say earlier about the 
what you do in the case of uncertainty is what the fuller development of the record has shown is that when you have uncertainty, allowing the procedure, which is unstudied and has never been shown to be safer, is where you have the risk and not the safety. The risk of what? The risk of harm. Of harm to Harm whom? to the woman's health. So it's not... Oh, you think allowing this procedure is worse for the mother? It is no better. It is absolutely no better. But you better. said harm. And it may be worse. Well, it may be, it may be That's worse. That's right. But and don't some doctors think it may be better? They think it may be better. And you think it may be worse? Well, the studies show that it may be worse. Some so doctors think it may be worse. And the studies show... And shows. some think it may be better. And the study that was done... But if you're a woman and you're, you've got one of those doctors who think it may be better, why shouldn't there be a health exception because for Because I'd rather rely on a doctor who relies on scientific oh, medical would. evidence. You I, really, you really would. would. Of course I would. If you were pregnant and wanted an abortion and your doctor said the best thing for you is this type of procedure, you would say, and he said, and it would be better for your health if I do this rather than D&E. You would say, doctor, you're a wonderful doctor, but don't do that because well, the guy who testified before Congress last year disagreed with you. If I had what was behind his opinion and what is behind the opinion in the, the studies, if it's a, it's a question of evidence versus... Do you really versus, mean that? Wouldn't any course, woman Your in Honor. America, if she's got a doctor she has confidence in, accept his medical judgment or her medical judgment? Well, Your Honor, the question is about the, the credibility and the, uh, of the opinion and what is behind it. And when there is nothing behind it, and on the other hand, you have incredibly safe procedures with a lot behind them, then, of then why rely you, on an unstudied... Ms. Wallstein, could, could I get you to return to the question I put to you earlier on? How, how do you say this statute differs, if at all, from the Nebraska your Honor, in the Nebraska statute, there were two basic problems that led the court to conclude that it could cover D&E. One was that it, uh, it used the phrase substantial portion of the fetus. So what had to be delivered through the vagina was a fetus or a substantial portion of one. Um, that was one problem, and that is a broad description. I mean, what the statute does in our case is it's a three-step process tied to a state of mind. So what is required is deliberately and intentionally, vaginally delivering the fetus to a specific anatomic landmark. When it's in breech or foot-first position, it has to be at the navel. The, the, na the navel and, or and below has to be outside the body. If it's in head-first position, the head has to be outside the body. So that really corrects the un potential unclarity of substantial are, are you then Are you then suggesting that because it's a different statute uh, and a somewhat different procedure, that a simple base application of Stenberg and whatever its standards may be is insufficient, that it takes something more? Well, no, Stenberg supplies the legal standard. And what is that? Which is, do, well, in the, in the question of what it covers or in the... Well, in uh, terms of judging this relatively new or somewhat different statute. Well, it, we know that if it covers D&E, it's unconstitutional. And that's why Congress greatly narrowed the way the procedure is described. So that's one aspect of the Stenberg decision. The other is if it creates significant health risks, it's unconstitutional. So you're, but basically, your argument seems to boil down to the fact that the Nebraska, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court held that in Nebraska, they had uh, failed to show that uh, the uh, uh, that, this, that the procedure, uh, the partial birth, birth abortion procedure, was a um, was not a not a significant health risk. They that's failed right. to make that show on that, that record. Exactly, that's what and the court says. And your point is that here we got a different record. Yes, that's okay. yes. Okay. Now, different. what about what about uh, what about so th so then you have this is interesting because this is a constitutional question uh, of applying. Casey, uh, maybe Roe before that, but certainly Casey and Stenberg, the standards, to these different statutes. But so, so everything seems to now depend on 
what happens in the 96 district courts around the country. But these are legislative facts, and they admit a broad, broad application. Uh, and it seems to me that under those circumstances, we can't possibly have a situation where uh, different courts are ruling in different cases all the time, uh, depending upon their view of, of, of evidence. Well, two answers. They've held a for certain procedure to be unconstitutional without, an, without a health exception. Um, two responses. One is that's why the congressional record and findings are Im so important and make this case different from all the state statutes because you have a central record and you have district courts looking at that record to assess whether what Congress found is reasonable and supported by substantial evidence. The, on, this, on the question of legislative facts, nothing in Stenberg tells us these are legislative facts. On the contrary, that was a record-based decision that said on this record we find Nebraska hasn't proven its case and so the statute creates significant health risks. So it's, I don't think it's a fair well, reading. Well, I mean, it wasn't legislative facts in the sense that they were looking at the facts that, that, that would support the legislation? And, well, they, and rather, you know, and, and not, not a not, you know, a, a, a fact of, the fact of what happened on a particular occasion, uh, but, 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 you know, the normal legislative facts. Well, Stenberg kept going back to the district court's opinion, didn't it? Right, and the findings. Um, mm -hmm. can, can I pursue your claim that the Congress has clarified the procedure um, and ask you this, does the statute apply only where the fetus is intact before death? Um, well, it applies where the doctor has the specific intent to perform a partial birth abortion. I understand so that. Are living, so it has to meet the elements. If, if the question yeah, but is... I, yeah, but I, wanted to, I asked you a slightly different question. The I question, want to make sure I understand the question. I'll, is it I'll that, ask it again. Does the statute apply only where the fetus is intact before death? The answer is no, if the doctor So this is not a statute limited to intact deliveries? Not, not intact as in perfectly intact. There's a three... Well, does intact come in degrees? No. I mean, if you have a, if you have a doctor who meets the specific intent, who vaginally delivers with the intention of performing the overt act that he starts a procedure intending to perform, and a toe is off the fetus, if that's the question, it's covered. How about any part of the fetus is off, is dismembered? Again, it would have, assuming it meets all the other elements, namely deliberate, intentional, vaginal delivery for the specific purpose so, of so performing the... So, so the, the many doctors who testified on your side of the issue who called this uh, intact DNX were talking about the wrong procedure, is that right? Well, it's the plaintiff's doctors who refer to it by that. Yours name. never called it intact? It, there are many names that can be used. Did in some of use. yours call it intact? I think it was generally referred to as DNX during generally, the trial. But didn't some call it intact? It, they, the doctors recognized that there are names that have been used. Intact d and &E, intact DNX, DNX, the intact of breach extraction. So version. anyone who called it intact DNX was talking about the wrong procedure. Is that right? Because on your say-so, it doesn't have to be. Well, I, what I'm talking about is how the statute defines it. Um, it. If they're talking about the same procedure, you know, that's part, one of the problems with all the names that have been used. Is well, if the doctors of this country want to know whether they're in, they're in jeopardy on this statute and they ask the Department of Justice, as I'm asking you as their representative, whether this is limited to intact, the answer is no. The answer is it's limited to what's defined in the statute. And if you're asking me whether you can vaginally... Well, that's a pretty tough thing to tell a doctor, isn't it? He, he, I mean, he, he doesn't run around reading statutes, but he understands what intact means. It means not dismembered in any way. So he wants to know, I would think, whether he's at risk. So he asks, as I'm asking you, is this limited to intact 
And you're telling me no. Isn't well, that so? I, I'm telling you that if he meets the other elements. Why is it such a hard question to answer either honor, yes or no? Because that's exactly the problem. All these terms. Doesn't that suggest it's not a clear statute if you can't tell us yes or no whether it's limited to intact extraction? Well, I answered it, and if, this, if the other elements are met and the toe is off or the leg is off, it's covered. So it does not have to be intact. The answer is no. If the other elements are met, including the overt act that kills the fetus that he intended to perform at the outset, it is covered. I don't know why it's so hard if the answer is no to say no. There seems to be some hesitation on your part. If Does it, is it limited to intact extraction? It's not, the fetus doesn't have to be perfectly intact okay. if it meets well, the other elements. Well, that's what I've been trying for six questions to get. The answer is no. All I right. take it the answer is no, but it also must be purposely and intentionally delivered for purposes of destruction beyond an anatomical landmark. That's exactly So that right. if something else happens, intentionally or otherwise prior thereto, that still doesn't affect the application of this statute. Is that what you mean? That's right. If the other in, intent-based requirements are met, along with the overt act and the other, all the other steps are met. All right, that's now right. I want to ask you on another topic. What is the constitutional source of Congress's power to regulate this method of abortion? I mean, it's, it's the statute enacted under the Commerce Clause. This is the Commerce Clause. And who is crossing state lines here that we should be concerned about? Well, Your Honor, that was, has never, has not been an issue in the case. Um, it's not, the statute well, well, is not I'm challenged on now. that basis. I'm asking it now. What is the authority? And you say it's the Commerce Clause. That was the basis of the Congressional And what is power. the effect on interstate commerce that is uh, affected by banning partial birth abortion? Well, Your Honor, um, it's not in the findings. I can't speak to that directly. Um, and it's not at issue in the case. Well, there have been several opinions lately from some justices of the court urging us to be very careful uh, with expansive views of the Commerce Clause. They urge us to be rather strict. And so I'm wondering whether we should be strict and say that this is no part of the Commerce Clause at all. Well, there's absolutely no record developed on that question. And who, and who loses issue. in that event? Who loses if it's not authorized by the Commerce Clause? If it's Who not loses Congress? if there is no record to show an effect on commerce? Well, it's simply, it hasn't been an issue. But if there is no record to show an effect on commerce, doesn't the proponent well, of the statute lose? I think it, the record would need to be developed, and then you could make a judgment. Why, why do we go back now? Why, why, why don't we take the record as, as you made it? Of course. I, the court is free to do that. With, I mean, Maybe if like it's, an not a, it's not an issue in the case. Maybe there's never like been an a record developed. Maybe you'd submit a supplemental brief if we, if we wanted to get into that area. We, we could do that. Yeah. You could brief it, but you, you, you're saying there's nothing in the record to show well, the effect on Well, I don't know. We haven't, we, it's never been an issue in the case. We haven't studied it. And, and, uh, <laughs> and so I do, not, do I you think as you it. stand there there's an effect on commerce? Do I personally think? Well, I don't mean personally. You, as the representative of the government, think that. Of is course that the there is. Oh, of course there is. All right, sure. then t tell me a little bit about what that effect is. The effect or the connection? Yeah. The traditional Commerce Clause Women effect. Women travel between, you know, to different states to, to obtain abortions, medical d instruments used in abortions are are ordered and travel through interstate commerce to reach their intended users. Um, I mean, there's, you know. Arguments to be made. <laughs> but no record. It was never an issue in the case. OK, right. thank and you. Can I, can I ask one other thing? What's sure. the substantial governmental interest that is achieved uh, by banning <coughs> this procedure? Your Honor, it's really a threefold answer. The procedure was found never medically necessary. No credible evidence it's safer. Potentially causes, raises the potential for long-term harm. And on top of all that, on top of that, it's an ethically different procedure than D&E and induction in that you have a doctor using the techniques that he or she uses to deliver a live baby at term 
to instead extract a living fetus to a point outside the mother where the fetus has its own autonomy separate from the woman for the specific purpose of inflicting a death-causing procedure that we know inflicts, from the evidence, inflicts severe pain on the fetus. Don't all abortions inflict pain on the fetus? Presumably a d and &E also inflicts pain on the fetus. So what's the governmental the, interest then the interest that, is that, that makes you have this a, procedure uh, more uh, uh, subject to governmental condemnation than the other procedures that inflict pain and death? The fetus, which by the way is at or near viability, that's what the procedure was developed for, so it's close to being viable. It's not limited to that, Taken, though, is it? The procedure is done after 20 weeks. It's not limited to that, is it? Not expressly in the statute, no. Not, not implicitly limited either, is it? But we know from the evidence that it's done after 20 weeks. It's frequently done, but we don't know, what we do know, the statute is not limited to post-viability. That's though. true. So well, we post-viability would be after 24 weeks. Um, well, didn't, so didn't the Congress also say something about wanting to uh, ensure that the line between uh, abortion and infanticide was not blurred? Did they, was there something? That's right, Your Honor, and that is due to the um, striking resemblance of the procedure to a live birth. Had, but had, has that justification been offered to your knowledge in respect of any of these partial birth abortion statutes in the various states? Well, it was offered by Nebraska and Stenberg. And, uh, Did Stenberg st speak to that specifically? It, Stenberg said ethical considerations can't trump the health considerations, which of course is true. Um, no, I'm asking but, if, if the Stenberg majority analyzed that particular facet of some compelling interest. It didn't analyze it except to say that Nebraska asserts these interests, which are similar, they're not identical to the congressional interests um, outlined, and it says basically that it can't, those interests can't trump the woman's health. Okay. Just one, one question. Um, what, is, what effect should, we be given, should be given to the fact that Congress made express findings that the uh, procedure is never medically necessary? I mean, how, what is that, where does that fit into the calculus? Well, Your Honor, that is the key medical question that Stenberg makes relevant. So I understand that that's a key question, but what is the significance of the congressional finding on that point? Well, the, uh, the significance, if you, you have to look at it in light of what Stenberg says about the significance of that medical fact, which is that if it's not medically, not medically necessary, it's not going to create a significant health risk not to have it available. That's true. I'm looking more, I'm focusing more, more directly on the fact that Congress said something as opposed to what a court found. Well, that's right. I mean, Turner tells us that Congress, it's Congress's job to make findings on these questions. Congress is better equipped. Should we, be, should we assess the quality of the work that Congress did in arriving at these findings? In the sense of how many Going hours? Back and and how many how hours and whether they, whether they did a thorough job? Uh, because if, 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 let's assume they didn't hold any hearings. Let's assume they just made findings and passed a statute that contained findings without, without any hearings. Um, or with a day of, uh, with, a, with a, you know, two hours of hearings in which they um, read excerpts of something, some sort of, you know, perfunctory hearing. Uh, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that weigh into our, our calculation? Well, uh, not tech, there's no rule or law that says they have to hold five hours of hearings or I'm not saying witnesses. specifically, but, but, but that there is, has to be a record of some kind. I mean, uh, the court is constantly looking at the record and, and, and particularly in the kinds of cases that Judge Newman just referred to, which have to do with uh, the effect on interstate commerce and uh, uh, findings that are necessary to abrogate sovereign immunity and that kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the question is really captured by <coughs> what Turner says is the court's role, which is to determine whether substantial whether the, con the conclusion is reasonable and based on substantial evidence. So that's the question. It, it, there's nothing in that that says Congress has to hold five hours of hearings or ten. 
the relevant inquiry for the okay. Can I ask you on another topic? Uh, there's a life exception for this statute? Yes, Your Honor. Do you have any doubt there must be a life exception, life of the mother? Uh, no, Your Honor. How could it be that if the procedure is sometimes necessary to save the mother's life, appropriate medical judgment wouldn't think that it's necessary to save her, her health short of death? Well, because... I mean, not every health condition results in death, obviously. Because there are... The, the evidence and the testimony was that there is... Although very rare, there are conditions that threaten the mother's life that require an abortion. And, there are... And don't those conditions threaten her health? No, not no. they don't. Well, they in she the just sense healthy, that they healthy, healthy, and all of a sudden the, she dies. In the sense is that, that they, it? if in the there's sense no status of bad health between good health and death. In the sense that they progress and they threaten her life, but they can also be treated so as to not require an abortion. That was the that was the evidence. So the vast majority can be treated so as to not require abortion at all. If an abortion is required in the very rare circumstance, you can you have either a D and E or an induction, which have been studied and are incredibly safe, as shown in the medical literature. Well, on that theory, you wouldn't need a life exception. You could always use D and E. But you've agreed we need a life exception for this statute to be constitutional. You could use D and E too. I mean, any time you, you know, any the claims, any time you could use a partial birth abortion, you could use a D and E. Okay. Thank. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court, Stephen Hutt for appellees. This case is controlled by Stenberg and the paramount protection it gives to women's health. And Judge Straub, on the health exception, I respectfully submit to the court that there is no difference between the statute issue in Stenberg and the one here. Moreover, the case comes up for appellate review on a factual record that demonstrates the unconstitutionality of this ban that in material respects replicates, as you pointed out, Chief Judge Walker, the very record in Stenberg. Well, but our record there, is far there is more a difference, though, is there not, in that that was a trial and it was based upon facts that were brought before the district court, and it wasn't a situation where we were relying extensively on facts which had been found by Congress uh, and have resulted in a ultimate finding of Congress. Well, so there is a difference, uh, it seems to me, under the circumstances. I don't think Stenberg, did Stenberg say that under no circumstances can there be a uh, statute without a health exception, without a health exception uh, in this area? Or just simply that they failed to establish uh, that, that that was the case in that case? Well, I think certainly so long as there was substantial medical authority, a significant body of medical opinion that believed and demonstrated that the ban would create significant medical risks, threats to women's health, there has to be uh, a, 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 an so exception. So there is an if. There must be something beyond simply saying there must be a health exception. If it Stenberg were, said that. If it were the case, Judge Stroud, that there could be a showing by the government, because the burden is on the government, that there was simply uh, no uh, room for any right, so medical that if doubt. If they could show that, if they could show that, that would make it something different. Isn't that correct? I think if they could, but they cannot. All right. And they did not. All right. All I'm asking you to tell me is that if there was this something else, that would make it a different circumstance, and you said yes to that. Now, we come to this case. We have Congress telling us that the evidence is overwhelming, never necessary, poses significant health risks, is outside the standard of medical care. We have a district court in speaking to safety advantages and medical necessity says these are theoretical, unproven, 
hypothetical, not credible, false. What flows from that totality that I've just recited to you? I think I want to take them one at a time and let me address the district court first. Um, to be sure, Judge Casey made some of those observations and some of those findings. Finding. But I would respectfully suggest at least these things. It's first necessary to parse to some extent what he was saying was theoretical, hypothetical, and proven. What he was saying was false. It's hard to do, but he laid it out with some clarity. What he found false to some extent were uh, uh, views that uh, an intact DNA uh, 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 was uh, necessary to avert certain specific maternal conditions in pregnancy. What he found only theoretical was the general safety advantages to which witness after witness, including the government's experts, Dr. Lockwood and Dr. Bowes, said were advantages of the intact DNA variation. He, he could only find those theoretical, and that is not a Let basis. Me what, that is Let not me a tell basis. you what's troubling me. We've got a statute that is at least arguably different, at least somewhat different. Not with respect to the absence of a health exception. Yeah, let me finish telling you what bothers me, and then you'll disabuse me of my sure concern. Thing. We've got a statute that's at least arguably different. We've got a Supreme Court opinion which apparently says that if something else can be shown, it may well be okay. And we have a Congress of the United States telling us the evidence is overwhelming against this. We have a district court with these very clear condemnations of the aspects that you say support you. Why isn't this a completely different scenario now? Well, uh, Judge Stroud, with respect to the district court's findings, what Judge Casey found to be theoretical cannot uh, defeat the need for a health exception. It cannot because, as Chief Judge Walker observed, it's the same evidence that was before the court in Stenberg. It was the reasons that ACOG had proffered. That's why I have a trial again. Well, that we should not have had a trial below. We moved for summary judgment. We agree. <laughs> Our summary judgment motion was denied, and it was denied for the reason, the understandable reason, Indeed, that the judge one wanted witness, to be if sure. one witness had told Judge Casey there's uncertainty here, he should have ended the matter at that point. That would have been fine oh, with us, Judge Straub, but, and nine of them did. Nine extraordinarily well-credentialed experts did. Now, with respect to the congressional findings, um, the government clings to the Turner deference notion as if it were a life raft, and they have to. But this is not a Turner case. And one of the reasons uh, it's not a Turner case. Well, what do you <laughs> suggest we do with these congressional findings? Not even bother with them? No, I think you have to look at them just well, what as Judge, do we do? Just as Judge Casey looked at yeah. them. And what you, what you say is, this doesn't seem as though it's a Turner and case. And he concluded that but he, assumed that he said they were unreasonable. He, that doesn't mean he was right. We might say the, that they were reasonable. <clears throat> well, if you, on, on, on view of the totality of the record, were to come to that conclusion, uh, then it seems to me that you are uh, uh, within your judicial purview to reverse it. I respectfully suggest you cannot, considering the totality of the record, any more than, as then Judge Thomas suggested in the Lamprecht case, you could say, or any judge could let Congress say, black is white, freedom is slavery. No, 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 but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking here at findings, a, an ultimate finding, and then we also look at the evidence to see whether what they did was a reasonable finding and whether there was evidence to support it, substantial evidence to support it. Uh, it's not just, you know, just calling, calling black white or something, it's, 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 it's a finding based upon evidence. We're, we're fairly used to dealing with those kinds of things. Is, is, is that the approach to take? Well, I don't think so. That's the yeah. approach that Turner took. Uh, we don't think Turner is applicable here. Uh, you should not defer to Congress based on substantial well, evidence. Once, once Carhart says that if there is appropriate medical judgment that a health exception is needed, can Congress 
possibly make a binding finding, no matter how many people say it's not needed, so long as there is at least some credible evidence that it is needed. I clearly am not Judge Newman. So, not then, on so then this is not the kind of case where substantial evidence is enough to uphold a finding. No, indeed, the substantial Because it's evidence. under Carhartt, it's the existence of contrary evidence alone that requires the health exception. I think that's precisely right. The substantial so this, evidence has, is at war with the Stenberg So standard. what we have here is a, is a, is a case in which um, there is a possibility, or you might say a probability, of in particular cases of an unconstitutional application. That is, a, per, a woman has a risk, uh, and uh, it, a health risk which is exacerbated uh, if, if this procedure is not used. And so um, it's, it's as, a, as, a, as applied, um, unconstitutional in some instances. But yet, from that we're to, to extrapolate that it's facially invalid in all instances. That's uh, correct, Judge. And yet, yet that flies totally in the face of Salerno and constitutional doctrine that we just generally understand. But as you pointed out in your colloquy with Ms. Wilson, Chief Judge Walker, we think that the Salerno test has no room in abortion jurisprudence. It had no room in case. Why is that? It had no room. Just in tell standard. me, tell us why that's so. The, the reason I think is that um, a facial challenge is necessary here for the same reason that overbreath challenge is appropriate in the First Amendment area, because you don't want to chill obviously desirable conduct. You don't want to chill the appropriate application of considered medical judgment to a woman who needs that medical judgment. You don't want to put the woman in a position where she would have to subject herself to medical risks and illness in order then to be able to say, as applied to me, this is unconstitutional. That is not desirable, and that is why uh, facial challenges for as long as I can remember in the court's abortion jurisprudence have been the preferred mode well, of whether, analysis. Well, whether it's good or bad doctrine, isn't it clear that's Carhartt finds us on that issue? Exactly. Carhartt didn't say the statute is unconstitutional as to a doctor whose case requires the health exception. It's certainly it's, been understood. It said the statute challenge. is bad for lack of a health exception. Correct. Now. And subsequent cases, a case called Sabri, has identified the abortion jurisprudence as an exception to the Salerno approach generally to uh, facial versus health. It's your position that if New York enacted one of these statutes tomorrow, an action were brought to invalidate it, the court hearing it could simply say, Given that there is no new medical data presented either here, nor in any other case, nor in any journal I can find, based on that, under Steinberg, I declare the statute unconstitutional. Could Judge Strava, I think should, yes sir. Can I come back to your previous assertion when we talked about what evidence showed in support of the health exception? And you said there were opinions and they, I think your word was, demonstrated that in some circumstances the procedure was necessary. Tell me what in the record, either of Congress or the court, shows that there was a demonstration that the health exception is necessary. Well, Judge Newman, if you mean by demonstration, I mean a, whatever you meant a by prospective, it. <laughs> um, uh, let me tell you what I didn't mean. Okay. Uh, there is nothing in the record in the way of a prospective controlled, double-blind uh, medical experiment. Mm -hmm. That does not exist. Uh, nor, under the circumstances, would we really expect it to exist. Dr. Newland, who is an expert on the history of surgery and medicine, testified to the development of medicine uh, and explained that that is simply not what you would expect at this point in time. What you do have, though, is uh, the testimony under oath of nine experts not, I should say, some ragtag bunch of folks testifying who, who practice at the fringes of obstetrics, but extraordinarily well-credentialed doctors who uh, are, are tenured professors at medical schools, including Cornell and Columbia, um, and Northwestern, and the University of Michigan. And what they said to a person is uh, that there are numerous 
safety benefits that attend an intact deity. And they were to some extent canvassed by Justice Breyer in Stenberg as well because they were uh, presented to the court through the brief there of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Those are, with respect to uh, the, the dismemberment uh, variation of DNA, uh, the fact that there's much less instrumentation and therefore much less risk of perforation to the uterus, that there is much less risk of bony fetal fragments and therefore much less risk of uterine perforation and cervical laceration. Uh, that there is much less risk of retained fetal parts and therefore much less risk of infection and sepsis. That there is, uh, that this procedure is shorter uh, typically and therefore that means less time under anesthesia, right. less risk so, of so is, it, is, it, is, it, is it fair to say then that the opinions on your side of the health exception did not cite specific instances where a doctor encountered those hazards, but rather expressed opinions supported by the informed reasons and judgments of the experts giving the opinions. Is that fair to say? Uh, not precisely, I think, Judge. Go ahead. They did encounter in their clinical experience, and there was a welter of it, and with respect, therefore, I think Judge Casey was wrong to consign these benefits to the realm of the theoretical, because they were based on ample clinical experience. Clinical experience that showed them on a repeated basis that with the dismemberment form of DNA, all of these hazards, uh, all of these risks are, are likely to be presented with greater frequency. When I say risks and hazards, I should make clear, and the record does make clear, that as, as Ms. Wolstein adverted to, uh, a dismemberment DNA is a safe procedure. But the intact variation of DB is much safer. And as between. But it's not so much safer that, 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 that uh, the dismemberment DNA is not used. If it was a lot of, if it was, if it was medically established that it was always safer, then it might be malpractice to do the other. Well, I think that's pushing it, uh, Chief Judge Walker. And, and remember that the intact variation is relatively new. We will see over time. And I suspect that uh, a number of our witnesses, had they been asked, would say that it is likely that with the greater frequency of this procedure, of this variation being taught in the major medical schools, as it is, uh, the, the uh, chief uh, witness of the government, Dr. Lockwood, said that he expected it to be taught in his program at Yale Medical School, though it hadn't been up until that point. As it's taught more frequently, there's every reason to think it will become more, uh, more widely used by physicians, more available. That is how medicine and surgical developments progress. Uh, both are well within, contrary to what Congress found about the intact variation, both are well within the standard of care. So, so when is the state permitted, under what circumstances is the state permitted to ban this procedure? I mean, if, you, if, 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 if someone were to come to you, uh, a legislator were to come to you and say, well, under what circumstances can we ban this procedure uh, with, and, and not have a health exception, uh, there would have to be, I guess, I, I, your, your argument is, a level of, of a, a medical consensus that it's never necessary. No. I, 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 a consensus that it's never necessary probably doesn't do it so long as there's responsible opinion on the other side. I think if you so, some say, responsible opinion to the effect that it's necessary is is enough to defeat the to the statute. Cor that's that's correct. I and would so, say that so that basically like, gives a veto of uh, Congress and the uh, 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 legislature um, uh, to um, to. Uh, or five doctors. Oh, wish. not at all. And the court in Stenberg and the Eighth Circuit in the recent Carhartt case, I think we're at pains to explain why that is not so. A significant body of medical opinion, substantial medical authority, uh, is, is substantial and significant for, by at least three tests, by three factors. One, there has to be some, some quantity. Uh, we're not talking about one or two doctors here. Uh, uh, we're talking about a, 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 a large number. We're talking about the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists who represent 44,000 
and is, by the government's own acknowledgement, the preeminent association of OBGYNs. So first is numbers. The second is credentials. Again, we're not talking about some fringe group of doctors uh, uh, whose, whose practice uh, could well be called into question. We're talking about people at the very mainstream of obstetrics and gynecology. And the third check on that is that an explanation is required. Justice Breyer explained in Stenberg that there has to be a, a record-based explanation, plausible one, for why the safety benefits are expected to result from the banned procedure. And here you have that in spades. Indeed, so you need the conflict. Indeed, you need the confluence of these medically related evidentiary circumstances. District court opinion, perhaps learned journals, records elsewhere. So it does take a considerable amount. Uh, and I am back and I continue to be troubled because we now have, assuming this is some slight variant here, a Congress which says the overwhelming evidence is to the contrary of what was before Stenberg, and a district court which in the last analysis ridicules that data. It doesn't, it doesn't respect So unless we find, not, unless we find that Congress was wrong and that the district court was wrong, I don't know how to get to your conclusion. Well, the district court certainly had no problem thinking that Congress was wrong. Uh, and, and indeed, as proof of the pudding, that to some extent he credited our testimony, he relied on the testimony that he heard to, to, to conclude that Congress is wrong. He relied on that testimony to conclude that Congress was wrong when it said that there was a consensus that this is medically necessary and never medically indicated. He said Congress was wrong when it concluded that this was a procedure outside the mainstream. He said Congress was wrong when they identified this laundry list of alleged uh, uh, safety risks and that the intent And his opinion is incoherent. I respectfully disagree. He thought that the reasons given were theoretical, and so he couldn't get well, be all the way there. Be careful now. I think you're being a little unkind to Judge Casey, and perhaps you're being seduced by the government's brief, which asserts on page 56 that the court, meaning the district court, found that plaintiff's contentions were incoherent, not credible, and theoretical. In fact, what Judge Casey said on the pages cited, 84 and 85, is that some of the reasons given were incoherent and some were not credible. There's nowhere I see in his opinion that he said all of them, as the government would have it. The government doesn't use the word all, I admit, but they said their quote is specifically the court found that plaintiff's contentions were incoherent, not credible, and theoretical. And in fact, there was, that was, those adjectives were applied to some of the reasons. Isn't that so? Uh, that's absolutely right, Judge Newman. And I hope that I was not unduly unkind to a district judge who ruled in my favor or unduly kind to my adversary. It's certainly not what I intended. It may be uh, some member of the panel was. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, th I think the member of the panel got it, uh, with respect, Judge Stroud, exactly uh, 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 right. The, Judge Casey used the testimony he heard to discredit all of the congressional findings, to, to substantially ignore them, even assuming that, that Turner deference applied. And that greatest of all findings, the one that really I suggest, like the clock that strikes 13 and renders false everything that's gone before, the proposition that this is never taught in medical schools where abortion instruction is provided. No, um, really. one, 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 one just uh, sort of a housekeeping matter, just so we know what the state of play is across the country. My understanding is that the, uh, there's, there's a, the First Circuit uh, case has been, cert has been granted in, in the First Circuit uh, in IOT uh, against Planned Parenthood, and that uh, there's a petition for cert in the Eighth Circuit case that is currently pending. That's correct, Chief Judge Walker, but AOT is not a partial birth abortion case. AOT is a, uh, a parental notification case. Parental notification? Okay. So, uh, so different, different, set, different set of issues. Yeah. Okay. I want, uh, well, my, my time's expired, and I'm happy to answer any of the questions that the court has. I did want to address one point on the government's efforts to 
claw at Stenberg and to suggest a standard, a standard respectfully, that I don't think Stan, Stenberg articulates, and that is that um, it requires a health exception only when a ban would pose, quote, significant, well, they do use the term significant health risks throughout the opinion. They do, and I want to I be clear about this, uh, Chief Judge Walker. First, it is used, but I think each time it's used, it's used in a descriptive way only. The court was simply describing those health conditions and risks that are potentially avoided by intact DNA as significant, as indeed they are. Um, Second, the court's abortion jurisprudence really, I think, does not permit that reading. It emphasizes maternal health as the touchstone. For example, I'm not the sure that I, 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 The parties are making a lot out of this, I'm not sure. I mean, an insignificant, what's an insignificant health risk? Uh, you know, it, it, it seems to me that if it's, a, if it's a health risk, it's a risk to the person's health, it's gonna be significant. I mean, you know, or, I, I don't know, I mean, um, is, is there some, is there some, Something I'm missing here? Uh, I don't see it. I completely agree with your articulation, Your Honor. Moreover, I don't understand, frankly, what it gets the government. Because if Stenberg imposed a significant health risks test, it had before it the same risks that we presented to, uh, to Judge Casey. It's the same record on the question of health and safety risks. And so the conclusion is, is, is irresistible that those risks are demonstrated to be and determined by the Supreme Court of the United States to be significant. And on this record, a health risk, excuse me, a health exception is constitutionally mandated. Right. Unless the court has any further questions, let me thank you. Very well, we'll hear Ms. Uh, Wolstein. Thank you, Your Honors. Just on the housekeeping front, um, Ayotte, the, the case that will be heard in the, by the Supreme Court on November 30th, actually does present the question of a health exception. The question, it, it does raise the question of whether the notification provisions are unconstitutional for lack of a health exception. I see. So, um, and just to complete the record, the Ninth Circuit will hear argument in the California case on October 20th. Um, Your Honors, it must be emphasized that we're not talking about the same evidence that was presented in Stenberg. The claims are the same. So to that extent, the claims are the same, but the evidence is most certainly not the same. Just to give you know, a small example, the Supreme Court relied heavily on the ACOG amicus brief in that case, which was, of course, an amicus brief, statements that were not cross-examined. What we learned at trial, for example, uh, contrary to what ACOG said in its brief, the instruments used in a D&E abortion are not sharp, they're smooth. And in themselves, the experts said, the witnesses on both sides, they do not pose a risk to the woman. The, the Supreme Court said also, relying on ACOG, that the dilation is the same for D&E and partial birth abortion. That proved to be absolutely inaccurate at trial. The Chazen study alone shows that uh, abortion, the partial birth abortion requ requires nearly twice the amount of cervical dilation, which is one of the main concerns about the procedure over the long term that has not been adequately studied. The change in study. You know, the problem, the, all this is very interesting, but the problem is that I'm not a doctor. I, I'm, I, not, none of us are. We have, to, we have to sort of, I think, take into account what the doctors are saying. Uh, and. and I mean, maybe, maybe the doctors, some of the doctors are blowing smoke. Maybe they're, uh, if you have a minimal number of doctors uh, who come in and testify that this is a safer procedure, uh, it, you, can, um, uh, you can say that uh, you can discount that uh, as not being a significant body of medical opinion. Um, uh, and maybe Congress is able to do that. I don't know uh, if, they, if they so choose, uh, provided they, uh, do it in a in an appropriate in an appropriate way. Uh, maybe that isn't calling white black. I, I don't know. I mean, but but here, what we're, we're 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 looking at this through the filter of a Supreme Court case and congressional findings with regard to this particular statute, and to ask us to just sort of sit and judge whether this is a better procedure or not is is not really. Uh, I don't think that's that productive, frankly. I mean, well, unless you're trying to say, make another point. 
Well, the question is, though, the constitutional question is whether the, and the central factual question is whether it's necessary or, or safer to preserve the health of women. So that's the question thrust upon everyone by Is, by is that the question whether it is safer or whether there is substantial medical judgment that thinks so? Well, substantial medical judgment has to mean something about the weight of the judgment and what is behind it. Does. It. it has weight implying, a, you mean, know, a preponderance or that type of weight. Weight applying, Im implying credibility and substance and. So and you think the doctors who said, who testified both in the court and in the Congress, that it is necessary in some cases, are just what crazy, uninformed, it, ignorant? It, it's not that charlatans. It's not that they're crazy, it's that that is not how medicine works. Medicine doesn't work on intuition. Oh, they, they think that's how medicine works, and they are leading doctors in this country. Who are you to say they're wrong? Your Honor, it's not me. It's a, it's a lot of expert Who, evidence. A lot of other that, doctors. <laughs> well, and, well and is the that what is, this is about, a battle of doctors, or does Carhartt say, so long as some reputable doctors say it's needed, that's the end of the inquiry. That was a part of the evidence that Stenberg relied on. It was not the entirety of it. And the fact of the matter is that what the record showed, the example of Dr. Newland, who doesn't, who said, testified that he doesn't do innovative procedures unless there's nothing else and gave the example of laparoscopic gallbladder surgery. Right, let me ask you a different thing. Is it fair to say this statute is not limited to post-viability abortions? It's fair to say. Is it fair to say that under Roe, a woman has an unfettered right to a pre-viability abortion? That's not accurate, Your Honor, in light of Casey, because what Casey said is before viability, a woman may not have an undue burden imposed upon her in her desire to have an abortion. So, um, so that is the test now. That's the governing test. And the well, does the, does the prohibition of a, of a procedure supported by some medical testimony create an undue burden pre-viability? It doesn't, Your Honor. The prohibition does not because of the availability of these incredibly safe and well-studied alternate procedures. So that's why it's not an undue burden. Uh, okay. But I think... You want, why don't you... Do you have another point you'd like to make? Otherwise, I think you could... No, I just... To clarify whether the court would like submissions, further submissions on the Commerce Clause point. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm satisfied without them. I, th I don't hear any uh, outcry in favor of that. <laughs> so, um, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, and we'll adjourn. Another circuit court, the Eighth, has upheld the lower court's ruling that the ban was unconstitutional. That decision has been appealed to the Supreme Court. They've yet to decide.